Welcome to our Monmouth Diocese video magazine, Flourish. And this time we're focused on the flourishing of the world around us and how, as God's people, we're called to cherish and protect his creation. But we don't have to look very far to see that there's a problem. Look at the extreme weather events that we've been hearing about around the world, at forced migration, driven by drought, and at rising sea levels, drowning coastal communities and threatening whole islands in our oceans. All this is largely due to human activity. It's becoming increasingly clear that we're doing a pretty bad job caring for the generous gifts God has blessed us with. So we're looking ahead to the United Nations Climate Summit known as COP26 when world leaders will get together in Glasgow and will agree, we hope, on how to deal more purposefully with what most people now accept is a real climate crisis. In our video, you'll meet John Pruitt, a farmer with his harvest. John is also warden of one of our ancient and rural churches, as his father was before him. John knows how fragile is the ecosystem on which we depend for our food. The Reverend Canon Tim Clement, our diocesan rural life advisor, will tell us about his work with farmers. Josh Evans will describe what motivated him to help organise a young Christian climate network relay through the Diocese of Monmouth to meet up with other walkers on their way to Glasgow where they will lobby politicians at the summit in November. And the Reverend Becca Stevens highlights some of the environmental projects created by people in our diocese and how you can get involved. The writer of the hymn Immortal Invisible says, We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish but naught changeth thee. The unchanging God calls us now to recognise how our modern lifestyles are changing his creation for the worse, and that we and our children will be the losers. Harvest time is the culmination really of 10 months of this crop being in the ground from the time we planted it back in uh, October and then um, doing every, everything we could to, to look after it in that period um, and then culminating in what we hope is a successful harvest. All we can do is do our little bit in preparing the soil and getting it ready and then um, trying to tend it but it's, it's God that does the main, the, the main growing of it and, and we're always very grateful and we never take anything for granted. Um, because you just, you can't assume that you're going to have a crop. And I think people generally uh, have got a bit uh, devolved of what goes on at this level. And, you know, they just expect food and supplies to be on the supermarket shelves all the time. Um, the, there's instances now where some shelves are, are short uh, because of, that's a distribution problem uh, at the moment and thankfully it is only a distribution problem so it, it should be temporary but there could come a day when the actual food's not there and then that is a very serious situation obviously. This time of year is one of the most important times because of the nature of the parish we are, it's mainly farming and everybody is involved in food production and very aware of how critical the harvest time is. I mean, we, we do get, we, we have a harvest all, every day. Um, God supplies his love in many forms and so we're always grateful for that, although perhaps we sometimes uh, it's not top of our conscience, but when we come to a very physical thing like combining wheat and you, you see the product there, 
uh, and it really brings home to you how important it is. Agriculture, farming, we are, like everybody else today, very aware of our carbon footprint and British agriculture you know, aiming for carbon zero by 2040, which is uh, quite a target. But we feel we've got to do it. Um, the, the only worry, well, there's a number of worries, but uh, we've got to be careful not to export uh, our problem somewhere else and import food um, where, where we, we don't know how it's being produced because we've given up a lot of our productive land to say tree planting or whatever. So everything's got to be done in balance. I'm sure you know, we can plant a lot more trees. We can do many other things. Science uh, will produce a lot of answers, I'm sure. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a com complex problem, but we're up for the challenge. A government official visited a farm and asked the farmer to list his employees and how much he paid each of them. The farmer said, well, there's John, who milks the cows. He gets £600 a week, plus board and lodge. There's Sally, who looks after the sheep. She gets £400 a week, plus board and lodge. And then there's that halfwit, who's out on the farm about 18 hours a day and does about 90% of the work. He gets around £10 a week, if he's lucky, and pays his own board and lodge. That's the chap I need to speak to, said the, the official. The halfwit. Ah, replied the farmer, you already are, because that's me. Rural living may be perceived as an idyllic, comfortable way of being, especially at this time of the year when nature is bursting forth with new life, both plant and animal. However, as that opening tale of the farmer rather nicely highlights, not everything in the garden is rosy. The backbone and indeed the beating heart of rural life has been agriculture and horticulture. But even when these industries have been reasonably profitable, there's also been poor weather conditions, like today. Disease, constant changes in rules and regulations, and a growing amount of paperwork for them to contend with. Demands from Brussels and now the uncertainty of the consequences of Brexit have put extra pressure on those involved with food production, many of whom have for years lived an isolated, lonely existence. The onset of the coronavirus pandemic has given us all a taste of at least that aspect of farming life and hopefully opened our eyes to the needs of those around us. Lockdown has, of course, affected churches in every parish, but in rural communities, the long-term consequences might be more dire. While Jesus promises that where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them, which is incredibly good news, he doesn't guarantee that church buildings will survive. The two or three simply may not be able to keep an ancient listed building going, particularly in parishes of few inhabitants. But please don't get swayed into thinking the diocese wants to close churches. That's not the plan. One of the major benefits of creating larger ministry areas is to encourage group parishes to help and support one another and along with Christ to enable all Christians to be a visible expression of his presence in all parts of our diocese. With low population numbers, rural areas have always been few, there have always been few local amenities. Over recent years, financial restraints on education have forced the closure of most small rural schools and even some of our youngest rural dwellers, dwelling children, now have a reasonable commute to school, elongating their time away from home each weekday. Many village shops, post offices and pubs have now closed and public transport is rarely seen in remote areas. Brexit and the pandemic have put more pressure on many similar and other small rural businesses, some of which are unlikely to survive even after lockdown is finished. And yet people are still choosing to move into the countryside. Whilst this is made mainly positive, it does mean that house prices continue to rise, further reducing the stock of affordable housing for locals, especially youngsters, forcing them to find homes in more urban areas and potentially raising the age profile of those remaining in rural areas. If home working becomes more of the norm, this problem may increase, and it may also mean the numbers of folk experience isolation and loneliness could grow. The upside of all this 
is that there are plenty of opportunities in the rural context for us to engage in Christian ministry and mission. Yes, it might not be quite the same as urban or city centre ministry and mission, but it is just as important. And the church in Wales is being called to be actively engaged in it. However, this isn't merely about increasing the number of church services or modernising the inside of church buildings and what happens in them on a Sunday morning in order to maintain our teetering existence. Rather, it's about recognising the needs of all parishioners, seeing what God is doing for them and in which direction he is going, and joining in with him to extend his kingdom. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he was talking about his people walking alongside them, whoever they are and in whatever situation they find themselves, offering them help and support. For our church communities to truly survive, especially our rural communities whose resources are limited, every one of us is being called to be actively engaged. Should you be feeling called by God to enter into rural ministry or to engage with it further, or if you have insights of rural ministry you'd like to share with others, please do let me know. We would love to expand what is already going on in many rural parishes. You may contact me through the diocesan office. God bless you all. As many of you will know, this creation tide is particularly significant. This November, the UK is hosting COP26 in Glasgow, the international climate negotiations, and the first big opportunity since the Paris Agreement in 2015 for countries to ratchet up their ambition to make new promises about how they're going to cut their carbon. It's also an opportunity for the UK to use its leadership in working with the international community in order to honour a decade-old promise for the community to offer $100 billion a year in climate finance to the nations who are being hit the hardest by climate change, have the lowest ability to cope with it, and have done the least to cause it. This is a real issue of justice, uh, and so as Christians, it's only right that we're taking a stand, raising our voice, and you know, being part of that group of people who are calling for change. And so I'm part of the, the Young Christian Climate Network, uh, and this year we've been organising a relay from Cornwall to Glasgow, starting in June and ending at COP on the 30th of October. I'm really so thankful to the, the people of South Wales, which is where I grew up, for their involvement in the walking part of the, the relay there. Um, I walked a day myself uh, from Cardiff to Newport, and it was such uh, a privilege to be part of that walking group uh, with so many different people, you know, from ages 15 to 78. All people coming from different perspectives, different um, backgrounds, but also united by this belief that, you know, we have a God who is love and believes in justice in a deep and profound way. And that as Christians, this is a part of our our walk with God, but also, in this case, a physical walk. Um, I'd really love to invite um, invite the people of Monmouth Diocese, which is where we finished in Newport Cathedral, to join us in contacting uh, their local MPs. You can go and do it on the, the, the YCCN website, yccn.uk forward slash add your voice, and be part of this movement, you know, walk with... God in calling for justice. And I'd just like to end by saying thanks so much to everybody who has been a part of this relay and thanks so much to everybody who's going to be part of this relay. Um, this is not a YCCN thing, this is something for all of the church, all of the UK to own uh, and be a part of. And we really hope to see uh, ambitious agreements at COP26. Um, so yeah. Let's do this together. Thanks. In April of this year, the Church in Wales' governing body declared a climate emergency and called on all parts of the Church in Wales to respond with urgency to the net zero carbon challenge. 
the motion at the time was described as both timely and challenging. Now, since then, we've witnessed lethal record-breaking temperatures in the Pacific Northwest, distressing floods in Germany, Belgium and China, and devastating wildfires in Greece and Turkey. The warmest winter by four degrees ever recorded in Chile, and of course the truly alarming climate change report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that states unequivocally that humanity is affecting the climate. Closer to home, in April, the Woodland Trust pointed out that the future of green spaces in Wales were at risk, which would be disastrous for the plants and animals in our local ecosphere. Lee Waters, the Deputy Climate Change Minister, has issued the call to action as he's admitted that we're way behind where we need to be on the 86 million more trees tree planting target by the end of the decade. So yes, the Church in Wales' climate emergency declaration and call to net zero carbon is both timely and challenging. And of course, uh, mentioning timely and challenging, earlier this week you might have seen that the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope and the Ecumenical Patriarch released a joint statement on climate change, a first such joint statement, and the statement challenges all of us. They call on everyone, whatever their belief or worldview, to endeavour to listen to the cry of the earth and the people who are poor, examining their behaviour and pledging meaningful sacrifices for the sake of the earth which God has given us. This week, at the most recent Church in Wales' governing body, we had an update on the progress of the movement towards net zero carbon. And of course, um, one of the points mentioned was that we need to move forward at a provincial and diocesan level, but also from the bottom up as parishes and ministry areas. There are uh, lots of ways we can be involved, from contacting the climate champion of the Church in Wales, Julia Edwards, with ideas and suggestions via the website or the campaigns page of the Church in Wales. And when you get to the cli dedicated climate page, there is a button that's, that says call to action, and you can press that and contact Julia directly. So if you've got ideas, uh, please do contact her. Now, in the update, we were told that we've uh, identified what we'll be using to measure our carbon footprint so that we now know what we need to offset, which is fantastic news. Um, so hopefully soon there'll be more news about that. So keep your eyes peeled for the uh, climate update on the Church in Wales website. But we can, of course, get involved in a parish and ministry area way. Um, and in fact, that's one of the ways that we can make a difference locally. Um, I want to encourage you by saying um, every ministry area can do something, whether it's small or big. Um, our ministry area began this journey um, a while ago. Um, the first thing we did was that we registered with our Russia um, to become an eco-church, and three of our churches have gained our bronze award and are working towards silver. Um, and we did that from changing things that are small to things that are a bit bigger. We did things like making sure that we all had uh, recycling boxes, compost bins, and of course um, building big houses. Um, we're planting trees uh, in the spring. And we've involved our youth group in using the green spaces we have, uh, both for fun and for reflection. And we've planted pots uh, to put plants in. But we've also engaged with our local schools and we've done litter picks and spoken to the children about what they think is important for us to do as a church to protect our environment. We can all make a difference. The question that we have to ask ourselves is have we, have we taken responsibility to safeguard God's creation? It's quite a profound question and it's going to demand a proud, profound response from us. Have we taken responsibility to safeguard God's creation? People like John and Tim and Josh and Becca are part of a church that wants to lead in response to the climate emergency. A church which has a vital and respected voice in our communities. Will you join them? And will you join one of our Climate Sunday services around the diocese on October the 3rd? I do hope so. <laughs>